G'day legends, Blake here with another video and in my most recent upload I discussed a disaster that I had encountered here in the fish room. It was absolutely devastating but it did get me thinking so for today's video I wanted to bring you 10 mistakes to avoid all to do with fish keeping. So these are mistakes that beginners often make but also seasoned hobbyists can make so sometimes it's good to just have a reminder so uh, be sure to stick through to the end listen to all 10 of these so that you can avoid those um, sad sad situations that we can sometimes have within the hobby okay so the first one it comes from a place of love i think but overfeeding uh, can really really create issues with fish keeping so it can either give you heaps of algae and excess nutrients but in the worst case scenario, it can create a bunch of ammonia and kill off your entire tank. So be sure to only feed what your fish can eat within a couple of minutes. For me, I like to lap around the entire fish room, uh, do my little feeds and then start again at the start and make sure that there's basically no uneaten food by the time that I've gone around and fed everything. Depending on how many tanks you have, that might be a good rule of thumb. But uh, best bet is to avoid overfeeding. And if you have to stand there and watch your fish, then so be it. Second one is adding too many fish all at once. This can be really difficult if you are an impulse purchaser like I can be sometimes. But um, you want to allow the bacteria in your filter to build up gradually. So uh, very, very quick crash course into the nitrogen cycle. You have bacteria in your tank that digest the ammonia put out by your fish. So that is going to only exist in a form that um, basically is sustained by the ammonia that's put in there. So if you have one fish this big, you're going to have sort of a quantity of bacteria, say this big. If you have a thousand fish this big, you're going to have a quantity of bacteria much larger than that. So if you go from having fish a fish load like this with a bacteria load like this, one day you just throw in 40 fish like this, it's going to take time for the bacteria to build up such to such as to the point that they can actually sustain the fish load that big so you have to add things in gradually and allow time for that to to build up so uh, you can't just go from zero to 100 with fish keeping you have to add things in slowly i know it can be difficult and sometimes it can actually be a bit counterintuitive especially with uh, peacock cichlids and boona and things like that that are going to have aggression ill issues um, there are techniques to do that, but this video will probably be long enough as it is. So uh, I'd say adding a whole bunch of fish in all at once is a mistake to avoid. Third one on the list is not researching or again, sort of impulse purchasing fish that you've never seen before. I think um, especially early on in the hobby, sometimes you go into a fish shop and you just realize, oh, I've never seen an Egyptian mouth reader before, or I've never seen, you know, um, whatever it might be just something that's come across your eye you've never seen before and you think that might be a little bit rare i better pick it up today you know these days everyone has access to the internet while they're out and about via their smartphones so it's best to just give it at least 10 minutes of, of quick googling making sure that you understand sort of the aggression levels the dietary requirements and the size that the fish are going to grow to before you decide to pick them up and take them home Number four can surprise people. So I wanted to make sure that this was definitely on the list and that is using bug spray or cleaning chemicals in and around the rooms where you have fish. So especially if you have a living room fish tank, or something like that, it's important to let your other family members know that you, know, you have to be a little bit careful what you use around the fish tank. So especially if you have sponge filters and other air driven filters, then it is um, potential that the chemicals are going to get go into the air pump and therefore into the water column. So definitely things like bug spray, uh, Windex and other ammonia based cleaners can really create a lot of issues and can be a real mystery, especially if you start to have a lot of die off. So uh, best bet is to avoid using chemicals in rooms that you have fish tanks or if you are sort of in a, a chemical heavy household, like if you're living with your parents and, and they like to use a lot of chemicals, then um, restricting all your tanks into one room, like a bedroom, and then just saying, you know, this is a chemical free room, that can sometimes be the best bet um, to avoid disaster. So uh, be mindful of what you're using around your tanks because yeah, things can get into the air, which will end up into your um, water column and, and can create disaster. 
Number five is definitely a, a bit more of a beginner mistake, but it can sort of creep into the hobby the more experience you get. And that is chasing numbers. Uh, you can spend all day sort of adding pH up, pH down, and a thousand other chemicals to try and dial in particular parameters. And sometimes you can find that, you know, oh, the pH might be exact, the GH might be exact, but your KH is a little bit low or any, any combination of those. And you can mess everything up by trying to chase a particular parameter. Everything sort of uh, interacts like a bit of a triangle with pH, GH and KH. So you can't exactly just add a miracle chemical to increase one parameter and not affect the others. So best bet is to keep stability along in, in your tanks. So uh, tap water, some uh, dechlorinated if you have chlorine or you're using a municipal water system. Um, basically, I like to use buffers that are, are more natural. So limestone to increase the pH or driftwood to lower the pH and keep it that simple and you should be fairly right. Realistically, most of the tank bred fish that are within the hobby are super hardy these days. And it's not like you have to e exactly replicate what they experience in a river system, uh, unless they're really, really fragile uh, wild caught fish, which I wouldn't recommend to beginners as it is. So um, chasing numbers is definitely something that I'd, I'd steer clear of for sure. It's always better to have stable water than the exact parameters the internet says. Number six on the list might be a bit controversial, but I've put down using plastic plants. Uh, plastic plants sometimes can leach chemicals, can be sharp or damage your fish, and also it's a missed opportunity to use live plants. Um, I think a lot of people get into the hobby and they concentrate on the fish first. They think, oh, I might add live plants down the track, but it's a bit um, complicated right now which I would suggest go the other way around. Um, it's always better to have live plants. They can really help to keep your uh, nitrates stable, keep basically a safety net uh, from disaster uh, with, with your tank. So they're gonna help you in a lot of aspects. So I think it's best to start with live plants before even adding fish a lot of the time. In any case, there's some uh, fish that just will simply shred up all live plants and to be honest, even if you are in that boat, I'd recommend putting some terrestrial plants in the top of your aquarium, such as pothos or devil's ivy, that the roots are still going to help with that nitrate um, sponging. So uh, I'd still recommend having a form of live plant, even in those tanks where you've got convicts or um, South American cichlids, African cichlids, or whatever it might be that are likely to eat uh, other live plants submerged in your tank. Number seven on the list is using too many chemicals. Uh, again, it sort of comes back into this chasing numbers scenario, but some people I find uh, they'll have dechlorinated, which is fine. They might have a bunch of different uh, fertilizers if they are using live plants, which uh, I'd suggest keeping it simple and using one good quality all in one fertilizer. Other than that, they might have buffers for all sorts of individual um, uh, parameters and might be adding in, I've seen this before, just preemptively adding in things like Melafix and Pemafix, which might smell nice, but I don't really believe they do a whole lot in the aquarium. In any case, they do also restrict oxygen. So definitely make sure that you have an air stone if you are going to use those products. But I find people will be adding those in. They'll be adding some salt in as well, just uh, for the fun of it and just as we mentioned, we really want to chase stability in our tanks and it's a really expensive way to mess all of that up, I find. For the most part, I don't think people need a whole lot more than just simple dechlorinator. Maybe if you're keeping a whole bunch of fish from a certain area like Lake Tanganyika where you know the pH is likely to be way, way off of what you're going to experience from your tap. In those cases, yes, of course, buffers and things like that are going to come into play. But for the most people keeping community tanks, I think simple tap water and dechlorinated is the best way to go. And you know, don't fill up your whole cabinet with all these sorts of um, yeah, random chemicals. Number eight, I would say is not having a backup plan. Unfortunately, when we keep glass boxes of water, disaster can happen. You know, something can hit the tank and crack the glass. The silicon can give way or you know, any number of things can happen. So it's good to have a backup plan. Does this mean that you need to have a thousand aquariums at your disposal? 
No, I don't think so. And a backup plan can be as simple as a plastic tote with a USB air pump, uh, maybe a couple of extra sponge filters that can just sit in the back of your ordinary aquarium and just cycle naturally that way. Um, but in any case, having that, uh, when you do need a quarantine tank or you do need a tank to put everything into whilst you repair or get a new tank if something has gone wrong, you know, it, it can be really, really stressful if you don't have that on hand and it can be an absolute lifesaver if you do. So uh, fairly ineffective, fairly inconspicuous to just have that stored in a corner somewhere and I think, you know, on that, on that rainy day that you do actually need it, it can really, really come in handy and save fish's lives. So uh, definitely keep a backup plan um, in place. Number nine, I would say is mismatching. And this is sort of related to not doing enough research, but I see a lot of people maybe, um, you know, adding, asking me, to, can they put like uh, Crebenzis and Epistos together? In which case I'd recommend only having one cichlid per layer of the aquarium at a maximum. So I wouldn't suggest ever having two breeding pairs of cichlids on the bottom layer of the aquarium, which would be that. As well as that, I see people say, you know, I've got a better fish and I've got um, some Julidochromis or other Tanganyikan fish, or can I put Maltese with, you know, a, a Pistos or whatever it is. And what you're gonna find is, even if you find some sort of middle ground with the water parameters, you're gonna have two fairly unhappy fish for example, with that one, with Epistos and Maltes, the Epistos are gonna be unhappy because they're gonna want that low pH. Maltes, of course, are gonna want pH much higher. So you're gonna have both fish that are quite unhappy. They're both gonna want the bottom portion of the aquarium. So they're gonna be constantly fighting uh, over territory. And once you have um, sort of the, the parameters not right, the fish are already in a stressed out state. So when they're fighting or any little additional stress comes into play, that's where you're gonna find that they're gonna drop off very, very quick, have um, all sorts of you know, issues with ick or bacterial issues or whatever it might be. And um, you just wanna minimize the amount of stresses placed on a fish as possible. So, um, so for those reasons, I do think that it is important, especially when assembling sort of a community tank or adding multiple species together, ensure that they have compatible water parameters, uh, but then again, don't stress about chasing a particular number. And as a rule of thumb, I'd suggest assembling a community tank where most of the fish are gonna be happy with a neutral pH around about seven. Number 10 on the list is a really common occurrence as well that catches out a lot of fish keepers, and that is not having lids. Not having lids is problematic for a number of reasons, obviously because the fish can jump out, and although some fish like top dwellers mostly are sort of renowned as being jumpers, all fish do have the ability to jump out of the tank and it can happen at the worst times when they're spooked. For example, when it's dark and you're asleep so that you don't hear anything happen. Or when you're out at work and something, you know, your cat or your dog goes by the tank and spooks a fish, causing them to jump out. That of course is disastrous, but the other thing is having no lid is gonna increase the humidity in the room, can create mold issues and all sorts of things. So although it is sort of um, a bit unsightly at times, and it's another thing you might have to clean, I do always recommend keeping tight lids on your tank because it's better to have them there than to not have them there and find your fish um, you know, as jerky on the floor. So uh, I'd always recommend getting lids and they're pretty uh, easy to make. You can go pick up some greenhouse panel, which is commonly called twin wall from most hardware stores and cut them to fit if your tank didn't come with the lid originally. So there you go guys, that is 10 fish keeping mistakes to avoid. Hopefully you haven't come across these yet, or if you have, you know, you've put the measures in place to avoid them. Um, if it has helped you out, and if it has made you realize something that could go wrong uh, before it has, then it always helps me out to smash like, hit subscribe and all that fun stuff. And other than that, I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.